Did some basic math for you this morning. We are nine days away from the Super Bowl, or AKA the Rihanna concert that I'm very excited to check out. Eagles, Chiefs, baby, three days away from Up and Adam Show live in Arizona. Guests on guests and tequila and ping pong and all sorts of fun. We are 57 minutes and 22 seconds away from the weekend. That my producers put in there, I wonder why. Uh, I will spend this time breaking down the game with the people who know the teams best. That's right, Eagles reporter John Clark, Chiefs reporter BJ Kissel. Plus we have happy hour with Sam Munson, of PFF, as always, and Solomon Thomas joins us to talk about the truly inspiring and incredible and important work he is doing to help others. And my producers are making me face the music on my preseason predictions. I don't know why we're doing that ahead of the Super Bowl, but here we go. We're here, very excited to have BJ Kissel and John Clark on the show, respectively. We got a, a couple of Kelseys to talk about. We got an Andy Reid storyline that's really nice. Uh, and Super Bowl's almost here. The vibes in LA, it's already happening. Everybody's packing, all of the sports media world is ready to ascend upon the desert where we are bracing ourselves for one of the worst traffic cities when it comes to Super Bowls, to be honest, but I'm not gonna dig into that. Instead, we're gonna look at some patches because it, Super Bowl can't be real until those Super Bowl patches are hitting those uniforms. It's happening, people. Super Bowl 57, Eagles, Chiefs. 10 days away, nine days away, 10 days away. Round up, who's counting? So let's welcome in these two gentlemen covering the Super Bowl for each respective team. We have uh, the brains behind the Kansas City Sports Network, BJ Kissel and NBC Sports and Philadelphia's legend, John Clark, both here. Gentlemen, good morning to you. Uh, and I thought what we could do is go through some, some layers of storylines here. We can all chat, or you two chat to each other, whatever. I need first injury updates, both quarterbacks, coming into this bad boy a little banged up. It's a tale of, are you more worried about a shoulder or more worried about an ankle? So let's start with BJ, and then John, you can follow with Jalen Hurts. Yeah, I think everybody was worried about Patrick Mahomes' ankle going into that game against the Cincinnati Bengals, and what we saw at the end of the game was Patrick Mahomes have one of the fastest timed runs of his career on the scramble out of bounds that ended up setting up that game-winning field goal. So we saw uh, what he was able to do with and his t the team around him with a week to prepare and get ready, uh, get that ankle ready for a game. So the fact that he's got two weeks, I feel pretty good about that. They do have some other uh, injury reports regarding the the players that he's trying to throw the ball to that are going to be ones that we keep uh, keep an eye on. Uh, especially as we get into next week and Wednesday, that first real injury report with the team practicing down there in Arizona. But uh, as far as Patrick Mahomes, it looks like he's going to be all right. Yeah, and if I'm the Chiefs, I'm more worried about Patrick Mahomes than the Eagles <laughs> worrying about Jalen Hurts. I think that sprained shoulder is pretty good. Uh, Jalen Hurts says, yeah, he's been going through something, but he hasn't been on the injury report for the playoff games, and I think he's going to be just fine with that shoulder. And then it's all about protecting Jalen Hurts, and you've got some injuries on the offensive line. Lane Johnson battling through that torn groin. Lane has been sore coming out of these games, but I think he feels it's a little easier than he thought it was going to be, and there's only a certain couple of things that give him pain. Won't mention it on here because we don't want Kansas City knowing, but uh, <laughs> I think Lane Johnson, he's going to battle with it. Uh, they're going to they're gonna give him whatever he needs to play through the Super Bowl, so I think they'll be okay. But I, I think the offensive line protecting Jalen Hurts, especially with Lane Johnson, that's going to be big. BJ, he's not giving you nothing. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know they're paying attention. They're going to watch this for sure and get all their injury updates and everything. But, yeah, I think the big ones for the Chiefs, it, it's Juju Smith-Schuster. Uh, it's Kadarius Tony. Coach Reed's expressed, expressed optimism for both those guys going to the game. doesn't look like McCole Hardman is going to be able to go in the Super Bowl. But uh, with Juju Smith-Schuster and, and Kadarius Tony, for those watching the AFC Championship game, uh, it was kind of pieced together at the end of that game with some guys that didn't have a lot of experience. So it'll be great to see those guys back out there. But, yeah, uh, I don't think anybody's going to doubt Patrick Mahomes' health at this point uh, with what we saw in that game against the Bengals and how quickly he was able to to do something uh, physical out there and, and get back to making some of the plays we're used to seeing him making. Without any of his receivers and throwing to Marquez Valdez-Scantling every other play, and you know he was able to somehow avoid the pressure and the pass rush of the Bengals with the, his offensive line. We'll see if he can do that uh, with this force and these waves with the D-line that the Eagles are going to bring to uh, the desert. All right, fun little coaching situation. You guys don't want to give each other intel, I get it. But there's a mutual, universal love for Big Red, right? He's coaching in his 38th playoff game of his career. He led the Eagles for 14 years against Nick Sirianni, who was, in 
fact, a chief's assistant for four years under Andy Reid, um, you know, and, and Andy Reid had to let him go. Sorry, Andy Reid fired him. He let him go. So that was a little bit dramatic. We never had him. Sorry, I got that in my ear wrong. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about Andy Reid. BJ, I'll start with you again because you cover him inside and out. How is he handling the revenge game aspect? How is his energy or vibe or messaging to his team different from this Super Bowl to the last time they went and won? And then, of course, John, if you want to follow with your thoughts on Andy Reid. And then Nick Sirianni, who clearly doesn't have the experience, but he certainly has the energy going into this one. Yeah, John, I'm sure this will surprise you, but Andy Reid didn't make a big deal of the fact that he's going up against the Eagles for it'll be the fourth time that he's gone up against them. It's not the first time that he's that he's been there uh, facing his former team and seeing those jerseys and all the I'm sure the feels that hit him a little bit when he sees the green jerseys and he sees some of those people. He's got all the respect of the world based on what he's told the media for, you know, the players and coaches uh, over there with the Eagles got great relationships with them, but it's more for the here and now uh, for him. And it's gonna be the same for the Eagles. I'm sure there's uh, it'll be a nice uh, reunion after the game <laughs> for them to chat, but uh, not making a big deal of it uh, is Andy Reid, which is not a surprise to anybody that's covered him for any length of time. That is so true. Uh, and you know what? Look, when Andy Reid came to Philadelphia, nobody knew what to make of him over two decades ago. We knew he loved cheeseburgers. He found all the great cheeseburger joints <laughs> in the Philly area. But this man changed the Eagles franchise. He turned them into a championship contender, uh, a team that had a shot every single year. He also basically changed the philosophy of the Eagles, and he showed everybody in Philadelphia it is all about the offensive line, protecting the quarterback. I remember they would draft an offensive line every other year in the first round, and all the fans would go, oh, my goodness, why do we need another offensive lineman? <laughs> well, we found out because the Eagles, they have followed that philosophy. It's an organizational philosophy, and I believe the Eagles have the best offensive line. So that is a credit to Andy Reid. And, yes, he is 3-0. Against his former Eagles, he will bring out some gadgets. He will bring out some things. He's got some stuff. He's probably got that Andy Reid inventory, like he'll click on his computer, plays to run against mm. the Eagles that they haven't seen and I haven't shown to try to beat his former team. But I don't think he gets emotional about it because, as you know, Andy Reid does not get emotional about things. He is even keel the whole way. Okay, well, give, you're talking all Andy. Give a little love to Sirianni and what he might bring to this thing. Talk about a guy full of emo emotion, and he'll certainly have it on the field on Sunday night. Well, I'll tell you, there, there it is. Uh, you've got Andy Reid, who's stoic and, and relaxed, and, and you've got Nick Sirianni, who just lets it out there. And, and Nick even joked. <laughs> he knows that a lot of people don't like him on the other side. He grew up, he was cocky in high school, and, and the rivals didn't like him. But he's going to let it out, just like he allows <laughs> – all of his players to let out their personalities. And look, I think that's one of the reasons why Nick gave up the play calling midway through last year to Shane Steichen. He wanted to be able to oversee everything and be in the moment and be able to have the connection with the players, the, have the personalities come together with the players. Mm -hmm. Cause I think when you're calling plays, you're so in to your playbook and your play chart and trying to get the best plays out there and always thinking ahead to the next, but Nick, He's got some time during the games to let out his emotion. So, yeah, I think this team yeah. follows that lead and lets out the emotion, maybe except for Jalen Hurts because he's very stoic, just like Andy Reid. He, he certainly is, but I don't know. I don't think you, I think you can say about both coaches that they both let their players let their emotions out. And the reason I can say that is because we have the Kelsey brothers, two very <laughs> emotional, personality-driven, let's let it fly guys, and they're facing off the first two brothers to ever face off in the Super Bowl. I, people are trying to downplay this storyline. I love it. It is special. So shout-out to Donna, shout-out to Ed. And let's take a listen to both of these brothers talking about it a little bit on their New Heights podcast. Listen to this, gentlemen. What are the chances that two guys go to the NFL, they realize their dream of playing in the NFL, then they become starters, then they become all pros yeah. and important pieces of their team. We're fortunate enough to be on that good of teams. And then they end up playing each other in a Super Bowl. It's got to be something like a lottery pick probability, right? Damn. All right. I love them. You two are around these, these two, respectively. They're pros. They're characters. They're needed on these teams if they want to win Super Bowls. I need to hear each of your best Kelsey story. BJ, you're up. All right. I want to go real quick back to John because you're talking about what Andy Reid did to, to set things up in Philadelphia, what he did in Kansas City. And a lot of people forget this because Chiefs have had some consistent success that when he got to Kansas City, they had set the NFL record for most consecutive playoff losses. 
Chiefs fans have been through a lot. So I know it doesn't feel that way for a lot of younger NFL fans mm. that have seen the Chiefs had so much success, but there was a stretch there for people that are around my age that we had some very brutal playoff losses. But uh, okay, and talking about Travis Kelsey, I, I always this year think of a story in, a, in an interview that I did with Kelsey. It was following the 2016 season. The Chiefs had just lost to the Steelers uh, in a game in which the Steelers kicked six field goals, didn't score a touchdown. They lost that playoff game. It was Kelsey's first thousand yard season of his career. He had been a starter for three years. And I remember asking him about leadership and just what what stood out to him about the year. And he said that at that point in his career, he really didn't know where he stood in terms of being a leader on the team to be able to stand up and kind of have a platform to speak to his teammates. And that when he was voted as a captain going into that year for the playoffs, it kind of changed his entire perspective of the responsibility that he had as a leader in that room. And then now what we've seen from him after that is he had six more straight thousand yard seasons. The Chiefs have had, you know, it's the golden age of, you know, Chiefs football right now with what they've had. And it's because of the leadership of guys like Travis Kelsey. And I always think back to that interview of a young Travis Kelsey just coming onto the scene, understanding pretty early on the platform he had as a leader. Uh, he went on to speak about talking with some other veteran players, guys like Tony Gonzalez, uh, obviously a legend, Pro Football Hall of Famer, saying, You have a platform years before you actually realize you have a platform to step up and, and speak as a leader. He learned that early on. And I think the Chiefs and the success they've had over the last few years years has really kind of shown that and a lot of it has to do with Andy Reid being able to groom these guys which John I'm sure uh from your time covering him there's similar stories down there with players in Philly yeah and, and I'll tell you when the Eagles won the Super Bowl first Super Bowl in the history of the city of Philadelphia they had a list the Eagles came up with a list of Super Bowl speakers for the parade Jason Kelsey was not on that list he was hmm. not on the Super Bowl speakers list at the parade think about that and then Jason Kelsey went to the Eagles and said, look, I think I've got a couple things to say. I would really love to speak if you give me the opportunity. So then Jason Kelsey gets up there and delivers maybe the greatest speech in the history of Philadelphia. I know we've had the Declaration of Independence. I know we've had some big things in our city's <laughs> history, you know, but Jason Kelsey's speech is the greatest ever. And he let it all out. You could see Howie Roseman, Doug Peterson, and players looking at each other. They were like, Oh my goodness, this is crazy and epic. And of course he was in the Mummers outfit, which is the uh, Mummers parade they have every New Year's here in Philadelphia. And then after I see Jason Kelsey crowd surfing through the crowd like Superman <laughs> in his Mummers outfit and drinking a beer, fans were handing him a beer every which way, kept on drinking every beer. Jason so Kelsey became you can basically put up the Jason Kelsey statue instead of the Rocky statue now because he is the man <laughs> in Philadelphia and, and a man of the people. He basically is the every man in Philadelphia. I think they're both just as important. It's equal. It's a draw between how important they are energy-wise to their respective cities. It's incredible. I'll ask you, John, is it – I don't know about Travis, and I don't know if you have anything to add on that, BJ, because you're so connected to the Kansas City Chiefs and just what's going on there. But, John, is it Jason's last year, his last ride? Wow, that's such a tough question because I thought possibly it was going to be his last year last year. I remember talking to Jason and Travis last year at Super Bowl week, and Travis said Jason loves the game. He, he loves the locker room. He loves, like, sitting around talking with the guys at lunch at the facility. But Travis said, look, he's got two young girls at home. Well, now he's going to have his third kid coming here. His mm -hmm, wife is yeah. nine months pregnant. She's going to be at the Super Bowl. But – I think that the lure of the three little kids at home may pull him away. And if he walks off a Super Bowl winner, I think he basically could hang it up because he has thought about it the last couple years. BJ Trav? Yeah. I I don't know how long he's going to keep playing, but what I can say is it's very obvious for both those guys that they have a career in media <laughs> that they're going to be very <laughs> successful with whenever they do decide uh, to stop playing. But I hope uh, for for selfishly, for our sake, that Travis Kelsey continues to play because it's a blessing to watch him play football. Same thing with Jason. It's it's awesome. The, their podcast is unbelievable. It's fun to listen it's to. so good. And from people who've been around, I, I can speak to Travis being around those guys like he's he was going to be successful at anything that he wants to do after football. I just hope he continues playing as long as, you know, his health and, and all those things that uh, that we don't always see on the outside um, are there that he wants to continue playing the game. He's obviously playing at a high level. It's so well said. New Heights is and I, I heard one episode right when the first episode I go there. This is 
Stars. They're going to be stars. I saw Travis Kelsey, weirdly, at Saturday Night Live, very early, first couple episodes, I go, this thing is going to be the biggest thing in sports media. It's going to be huge, and I, I love everything about it. So if anybody hasn't listened to it, give it a listen ahead of the Super Bowl. Um, and full of storylines. The, the Kelsey Brothers guys is just one of them. So quickly, I want to get to these next two so we can hit a break here. What is the storyline that we should all be paying more attention to, John? For me, because, look, I think the Eagles are going to be able to score some points on the Chiefs' defense. It is so hard to stop the Eagles' offense with the passing game and then the running ability of Jalen Hurts mixed in. The RPO, they run more RPO than anybody in the NFL, and that is so hard to stop. We saw what they did to Fred Warner. So my key is slowing down Patrick Mahomes and that offense, and the Eagles' defensive line is the perfect thing to do it because – they have 78 sacks. They're four away from the NFL record for an entire season. You saw Hassan Reddick coming from that left mm-hmm. side. He wrecked the game. He got Brock Purdy out of the game, not on purpose, but he not only gets sacks, he forces fumbles. So Patrick Mahomes on that high ankle sprain, I know he's eluded some would-be sack artists uh, in the playoffs so far, even with that high ankle sprain. But I think the Eagles defensive line, they basically got two lines. They keep them coming. That's going to be the key to me, getting to Patrick Mahomes. And if that happens, I think the Eagles win. Yeah, I'd flip to the other side of the ball, but I, I will say I hope the Chiefs don't try and block Hassan Reddick with a tight end. I think there might be a better plan uh, for that. I know they can do different things with formations, but that would be helpful uh, to not do that with the success that he's had. And, and you know, tell Andy Reid anything about Hassan Reddick. He was at Temple with his son, both of his sons being at Temple at that time. They're very familiar with what Hassan Reddick can do. But for me, it's on the other side. It's going up against um, this. It's the Chiefs defensive line against uh, the number one offensive line that throughout the entire season with with the Philadelphia Eagles and that, I mean, I'll tell you, John, but all five of those guys ranking in the top 10 at their respective positions uh, per fro- pro football focus, it's a completely different situation uh, than they had last week against the Bengals, but you're still looking at the Chiefs defensive line. That was kind of the storyline going into facing a banged up Bengals offensive line and now it's still the Chiefs defensive line that to me is the storyline going up against that number one offensive line because what Jalen Hurts can do with his legs, what Miles Sanders can do. I mean, they've had five games where they didn't have 100 yards rushing in the entire season. And anytime, not to make football too basic, that we always talk about getting pressure on the opposing quarterback, not turning the ball over, but it starts with stopping the running game. Steve Spagnuolo, um, that's always been his thing. He's always had a good plan uh, when he steps into these big games, but it's still the Chiefs defensive line against the opposing offensive line. It's just a completely different kind of situation this week because of how good the the Eagles have been getting some pressure on Jalen Hurts. The Chiefs had a lot of success uh, slowing the Bengals down on first down. They're going to need that again to try and get them in a little bit more passing situations again. Not next level analysis or anything, but uh, they got to have some no, success and not make those third and ones, third and twos. They got to they got to slow them down. They had success with it last week. They need it again because these guys can get after it up front. And the run, you mentioned it, 148, four touchdowns last week against the number one Niners defense. Obviously a bit of a wonky game, but don't let Miles Sanders, not just him, Boston Scott, who had, he's on a roll. He's feeling himself. I talked to him. He <laughs> took care of business against the Giants like he always does. Then he showed what he can do against the Niners in a formidable D. So it'll be an epic game. I wanted to tell you, ask you guys to be nice to each other and say something nice, but everyone's <laughs> getting along so well. This will be an epic matchup. I'm going to try to pull both of you on Radio Row or find you at least sometime. Uh, enjoy, hopefully, your travels out to the desert if you guys are going. The Kansas City uh, Sports Network, of course, will be all over the place racking up those air miles. BJ Kissel and uh, <laughs> NBC Sports in Philadelphia legend John Clark, thank you both and enjoy the Super Bowl, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see he has a Super Bowl background. I'm going to have to try to get one. He's got a trophy behind him. Maybe there'll be one coming to my set here. I was DJ? I was lucky a few I was lucky a few years ago I got to go along for the ride and it was it was special and uh, I'm looking forward to all the people I used to work with uh, getting a chance to go down there and hopefully get another one it'll be a good game now and nothing against the Eagles. This is great. I think Donna and Ed Kelsey have brought us all together. Love you both. and so Enjoy it. And we'll be back after this. Uh, coming up, I will share a conversation that I had with a New York Jet named um, Solomon Thomas. You've heard of him. He was a high draft pick to the Niners. We talked about the importance of prioritizing mental health in locker rooms across the country. Take a look and we'll see you in a minute. The sports side of, of mental toughness and mental health, yeah. like, um, you know, all, all the work that Kobe did about being present, you know, um, 
channeling your emotions, the true meaning of mental toughness, which is not just to tough through everything, but to compartmentalize your feelings. It's about accepting them and working through them and, and being one with yourself. There he is, your Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee for the New York Jets. Solomon Thomas' story isn't all about the ups and the triumphs and all of that. Uh, he has not had the easiest journey, to be honest, into the NFL. Third overall pick, of course, by the Niners back in 2017. Slowly started to adjusting to the big leagues, as any rookie does. And then in 2018, just a year later, he lost his big sister, Ella, to suicide. She took her life. And then he created the Defensive Line Foundation with his parents in honor of her. And since then, his mission, his parents' mission, has been sole and simple, to spread awareness and help give access and pathways and resources for mental health by using his platform to do that, to do good in that way. Solomon is the Jets 2022 Walter Payton of the Man nominee, and you'll see why. You believe you've been in the league six years? It's crazy. It goes by fast. It goes by fast. It feels like a long time, but it still it still goes by fast. Like you, you learn so much, you grow so much. You come to the league and you're like, you're this like young, immature kid, and then you just learn and you grow and become a man. It's it's crazy how fast it goes. Oh, what a nice play by Solomon Thomas. You are the 2022 Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee for your Jets. I mean, that is the highest honor. Yeah, no, it's such an honor, and I'm, you know, so honored to be the Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee, um, you know, to have that, have my peers and my teammates, you know, vote, vote me as that and, and be recognized as my peers. Like, you, I never do the work I do for in a world or for, for recognition, but, um, you know, it's, it's truly, it feels good to be, to have my work be noticed and have, to know that I'm out there making a difference and, and, and you know, putting good work out in, in the world. So just trying to do that in every way I can. You're the co-founder of the defensive lines alongside your parents. Uh, and it was created out of something that, that you dealt with personally. And that was the passing of your sister, Ella. And I imagine that impact on your life is still felt today. Every day you wake up. Definitely. You know, I, I miss my sister every day. You know, uh, I miss her so much. Uh, you know, she meant the world to me, um, you know, and, and, and it's a pain that I'll forever feel, but I'm trying to turn that pain into something where I can help others. You know, my sister had a dream, she had a goal. Um, to help others who were struggling with mental health, to help young girls who were um, who were sexually abused. She, she had these missions, and we're trying to carry them on, on for her. Um, you know, we know how much she wanted to to love love others. And through this work, uh, I believe it's so important um, to to make one person uh, not feel the way that Ella's feeling and make one, one family not feel the way that my family is going through, through losing Ella. But it's all worth it if I can save one life, if I can save one family from going through what we went through. Um, you know, and, and that's that's what this work is about. Yeah, you've described yourself as a quote unquote passionate fighter for those who are struggling. So I can't imagine uh, how important this recognition of your work in the mental health community means to you. No, yeah, it, it means a lot because it's, it's a world where a lot of people feel alone. So I just want to fight for those people because I've been in that position. I've been in, this, in, in a spot where I felt alone, where I felt like I have no one to go to, that I have to be a man, I have to be tough um, in the wrong way. And I, I had to learn how to get help. I had to learn how to talk, go to therapy and talk about these things. I, I believe suicide is the most preventable, preventable death. And so I'm trying to do all I can to educate those on mental health, on how to get help, on where to go for resources, and just to talk, start the conversation. Through my own mental health journey, um, you know, I've, I've, I've learned a lot. You know, I've learned that it's okay not to be okay. Um, you know, I learned it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be depressed. Like, like these are feelings of, of the human experience. And, you know, I, I've learned how important it is, you know, to ask someone how you're doing. You're hearing from families and kids that you are inspiring. Have they inspired you? I've been, I've been so inspired and, I, and I'm learning every day. You know, I'm learning so much about this work. Um, you know, just inspired by all these people who, who have had so many similar stories and who are still fighting every day. And now I understand from going through my own personal journey and learning from my sister's story, that I understand how much strength that takes to be here every day. Like that motivates me in, in, in every way. Um, um, I went, was going through my sister's Instagram yesterday and um, I was looking for a new wallpaper and, uh, she had this this uh, picture that says, you never know what somebody's going through, so always be kind. And it, it, it's so true, because you never know what battle someone's facing. You know, in, the, in this world, we are, we're always presented with the good, don't be a burden, you know, don't bring someone's mood down. And we don't really know how people are doing it. The sports side of, of mental toughness and mental health, yeah. like, um, you know, all, all the work that Kobe did about being present, you know, um, 
channeling your emotions, the true meaning of mental toughness, which is not just to tough through everything, but to compartmentalize your feelings. It's about accepting them and working through them and, and being one with yourself. We're running these programs and we're going to schools and, and teaching them, you know, teaching mentors how to look out for warning signs, how to conduct a, a safe mental health environment. It's going to, you know, amazing work, uh, suicide um, prevention, education and, and awareness. Well, I know the Jets are super proud, Jets fans, super proud, NFL fans like myself, super proud, your mom uh, and of course, Ella, all proud of you. So Solomon, congratulations and thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. I appreciate you. You're a badass, Solomon. God. <laughs> so really are you. <laughs> okay, I don't know why I mean enough to include me calling him a badass. And no, no, he was amazing. I love talking to him. We chopped it up about his career, what he's learned. It's it's cool to watch a player evolve and grow, and then to watch a player smile like you just saw him smiling there in the light of what happened to him and his family. I remember his draft week. I had like some direct TV deal and before I even met Solomon Thomas, I met his mom and I sat with a panel and it was like Trubisky's mom and, and his mom and I can't remember the other moms because Solomon's mom really stuck out. She really stuck out as somebody who, you know, labored on raising her kids to help other people. That was important, that's something I saw. I saw a ray of light in his mom and you see that in Solomon Thomas. So I just wanted to thank him for being so vulnerable and candid and open uh, and taking the time with us. That's never easy. And we also, if you see the, um, on the screen, the QR code is there. So if you can donate towards the defensive line um, to help reduce the stigma behind talking openly about mental health. And thank you to Solomon for being such a pioneer in that and a force in that. We love to see it. And if you um, can't contribute, you just want more information maybe, or if you, you or a loved one are struggling, you can text 988, the number 988, to be connected with a professional right away. It's anonymous. Um, and it's something that Solomon Thomas champions and has a partnership even with Dak Prescott to work on to, to help and alleviate and provide resources. So our best wishes to Solomon, to his whole family, sending our love and the Defensive Line Foundation. And is he going to be on that red carpet for honors? Is he, is he reeling in that Walter Payton Man of the Year campaign uh, that he's you know, vying for, of course? There's already, I think that he gets money already, right, from the foundation. The winner gets a bit more. So we're rooting for you, Solomon, and all the guys who are doing great things. We'll see who wins Walter Payton Man of the Year, of course, during NFL Honors on February 9th, and we'll be right back. All right. I am going for it. It's like I was just yelling at me in my ear this morning. It's Friday. Relax. All right. These three were running all over the field this year, and guess where the leading rusher, Josh Jacobs, will be next week? Right here on the Up and Adam Show. Very excited to have him. Led the league in rushing. We're going to go through my NFL predictions, my preseason predictions. It was not one of them. I had his quarterback. I had his quarterback, Sam. I had Derek Carr leading the league in passing as one of my preseason predictions. And to that, I drink Firestone Walker 805 properly chilled California beer. Nice. I, I almost let us down today. I, I'm in the PFF offices here, not at home, and I left the beer that I was going to bring at home. Thankfully, the PFF offices has enough of a drinking problem that I was able to steal something from the fridge and still get a hot crowd. So we're good. And we love to see that. We appreciate you, Mr. Collinsworth, for providing the booze this morning out in the natty. All right. You, my friend, are a busy guy. Co-host of the PFF NFL podcast, PFF's lead NFL analyst, Sam Munson. Let's do our thing where we like to get PFF'd up. And let's start with the number 720. That is the number of Up and Adams beanies I'm going to be giving out at Super Bowl week. I hope you'll be there, Sam. We will. We'll be there. We're there uh, starting next Monday. We're there all week. 720 is a cool number. It's the number of snaps that the Philadelphia Eagles have played this season with a lead, which is by far the most in the NFL. Like teams play, you know, a thousand wow. plus snaps in a season. They have led for basically the entirety of their year by far the most in the NFL. You can argue that they haven't been tested as much as other teams, but the Eagles have been real front runners this season. And... I'll go a little deeper. The team that has scored first in the Super Bowl, my friend, 37 and 19 overall. So little Eagles thing for that. Do you think Marissa wrote the tags and jokes today? Of course she did. Miss Fly Eagles Fly over there. The next number is 52. Marissa wrote this. The number of weeks in a year I wish I was on vacation. Marissa. It's nice. Hmm. 
52 is think? the number of sacks that the Eagles defensive line has had from just a four man rush. So without having to blitz, without having to send extra guys, they have the number one pass rush in the NFL, the number one pressure rate in the NFL, and they get home with just four guys, which is the best thing a defense can have when it comes to rushing the pass. Uh, we love that. And in total, the Eagles defense apparently has 78 sacks, including the playoffs. That's third most in NFL history as you take a sip there behind only the 84 and 85 Chicago Bears. The, the last time <sighs> the Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl. All right, let's move on here. We got the number 32 teams. Okay, 32, I think, number of NFL squads, but what does it mean for the Super Bowl? 32 is also the number of passing touchdowns that Patrick Mahomes has from inside the pocket this season. So we always think about all the crazy stuff that Mahomes does outside of the pocket, you know, when he's on the run, the crazy plays to Kelsey, but this is why he's such a problem for NFL defenses, is even if you keep him to the pocket. Even if you put him inside, keep him, contain him, do everything you're trying to do, he's still likely to carve you up. There is no answer to defeating Patrick Mahomes right now. We were talking to BJ Kissel um, of Kansas City Sports Network, and he was giving a lot of credit to Andy Reid and what he did when he came in. And he was saying young fans don't realize how bad the Chiefs were before Andy. But we got to give Mahomes love if you're going to give Andy love. Before Mahomes got to KC, the Chiefs franchise had eight playoff wins total just eight wins and he's now 10 and 3 in the playoffs looking for his second Super Bowl in three seasons it is so impressive all right the next number is 77 um Marissa wrote how old Kay will be when she finally hits a parlay wow that's cold that's cold 77 is the number of pressures that Chris Jones had this season which is the first Oof. time that a not Aaron Donald interior lineman uh, led the NFL in since Donald's coming to the league, basically. Chris Jones had a true defensive player of the year kind of season, and he's only kicked it up a notch in the playoffs. He's got another 16 pressures. We saw him take over late in the AFC Championship game. Chris Jones right now is one of the most unstoppable players in the entire league on either side of the ball. Uh, we, we love to see it. Chris Jones, 17 and a half, including the playoffs, the third most in the NFL, of course, this season. Now, what is happening here? It's been a wild and wacky year, and you're going to ask him. We're going we're gonna to ask me <laughs> questions now? What? What's happening? Are you asking me questions, PFF year in review, Sam? Take over. I think, yeah, I think I've got to ask you who was leading oh, in PFF grade at certain positions. So, um, okay. Best graded, I think pass rusher was where we were starting. I think we were starting with the order I've got. So who's the best, best graded, graded PFF pass, pass rusher? rusher? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Is it Miles Garrett? <laughs> it that is. Would be my guess. It's Miles Probably Garrett. Not. Damn. There you go. Other guys had better statistics. Other guys had more pressures, but Miles Garrett had the best pass rush win rate and the best PFF grade, despite a worse team around him. I'm going to PFF. I'm cheating. C continue. What's the next one? Okay, the next one is best cornerback. Oh, pfft. I'm a, can, is it Slay? Can I say Slay? Rookie. Rookie Sauce Gardner. Oh. oh, Sauce. I'm trying to get Sauce on our show. Can I tell you how many sponsorship deals Sauce Gardner has going into next week? He is everywhere. There's no room at the end when it comes to Sauce Gardner and what's going on. But he deserves it, doesn't he? Yeah, absolutely. That guy was incredible from day one. Gave up one touchdown all season, and it was a miscommunication in the Jets' defense. Um, best quarterback, the final one, the most important position. The best graded quarterback? It's got to be Mahomes or Allen or Burrow? Is it Bur I'm just going to go with my heart and say Burrow. So if you include the postseason, it is Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow over all games was the best graded quarterback in the NFL for I think the second season running. I think last year he just edged really? it as well if you include all the playoffs. Um, what did you say, Richard Meyer? How can I? I don't know because I don't have my phone, so I don't have the PFF app. But if I had the PFF app, I wouldn't have been two out of three. I would have been three out of three. And everybody's got to download that darn app for the Super Bowl and for everything beyond that, especially with the 
free agency, with the combine, with everything going on. All right, last but not least, let's get your Super Bowl pick, Sam Munson, who will be at Radio Row, who I hope to meet in person next week. And thank you for this every Friday. It has been an absolute treat, my absolute favorite segment. Who you got? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think it's going to be a great game. I think because the Chiefs have been there, they've done that because everybody is focusing on the Eagles. I think Kansas City ends up getting another one from Mahomes. Getting another one with Mahomes. We'll see. I, I imagine Jalen Hurts and Mahomes, both top five PFF graded quarterbacks on the year. Uh, Mahomes certainly is. Did Jalen Hurts make it into the top five? He was certainly massively Herbert better than any previous season we've had from him Alan before. Alan Herbert. Uh, he might not Hertz be. Alan and Herbert probably above him. He no, does. Hertz got okay. In there, Interesting. Yeah. Ooh, we'll see what matters: the shoulder or the ankle. Sam, I appreciate you. My drinking buddy will have to do this uh, on Radio Row, where I'm sure you're not surprised. I will have a bar set up. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'll see you then. <laughs> Come see me. I'll keep everything properly chilled, as Marissa has this entire segment with her little shots at me. Oh, you're a smile? Okay, Marissa McBride, I see you. We'll be back after this. Oh, because oh, I get to do another really fun thing and talk about all the, the dumb stuff I got wrong. Oh, champions. Girl, hit my ass! I told y'all when y'all drafted me, we was going to go to the Super Bowl. We going back, baby! Sag Nation! <laughs> task ahead of them in the Super Bowl in two weeks. Know your role and shut your mouth, you jabroni! Eli Apple, I'm gonna smoke one for you. We're going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. The one went away from something that we all dreamed about. The job's not finished. We might as well win the whole thing. Let's go. Let's go, Chiefs on three, one, two, three. Yeah. Some clothes on, guys. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. I love Jabroni is the best line I've ever heard. I'm sorry. And I love Jason's mummer. It beats it. It beats it beats the whole speech. That was so freaking funny. Okay, conference championships out the window. We are waiting impatiently, if you're me, for Super Bowl 57. So my producer thought oh, this will be fun. Let's revisit your preseason predictions. I made nine. By the way, we start, we decided to start do a show like August. 15th and then did a show August 18th. So I was, <laughs> it was very against the gun. I was thinking about that yesterday, that's crazy. But let's take a look at what I missed and then more importantly, what I hit on, which is great. All right, here's a couple of my preseason predictions. So Justin Herbert wins MVP, Derek Carr, okay, that didn't happen. Okay, okay, Jameis Winston, comeback player of the year, that did not happen. Oh, and look at number five. Bum, ba -da -bum, ba -da -ba -da -ba -bum, ba -dum. Let's start with this Justin Herbert. Let's, get, let's dig into this one. Okay, it didn't hit. Oh, we got another one. We got the other page. Lamar Jackson, okay. De well, to be determined. Can you get paid, Lamar Jackson, please? Uh, AFC team gets a ring. Well, that won't happen. They got a ring not long ago. Trubisky starts every game for the Steelers. Why are you guys making me relive this? And Tua proves everyone wrong. I would make that prediction next year again. I love Tua Tungavailoa. And I hope he comes on our show next week because I'd love to sit down with him. Okay. The Justin Herbert one is, is an ask. Obviously, I blew it on half of those. But we're all about accountability and credibility on the show, so that's fine. But I wanted to dig into the Herbert of it all because it didn't hit. But it's an interesting one to talk about right now. Kellen Moore comes in, just a jobless for all, all of five seconds, and he's going to roll in as the offensive coordinator. And I think I was just, as I always am, a year too early. You know, just a year too early on this. Some people are fashionably late. Bandwidth. I'm just early. I was, I've been about this eight years early <laughs> on the Chargers. Herbert plus Kellen Moore, chef's kiss for next season. I know Justin Herbert didn't have the major season, maybe deep into the postseason. We were all expecting the numbers were good, though. The fantasy stats were good. The expectations, they've been set so high for the young star. It's almost impossible. This season, he saw a bit of personal regression numbers wise. He was still top 10 in major categories. He threw for the second most passing yards in the NFL just under like 4,800, eighth in touchdown passes with 25, third best completion percentage at a lick. A lick under 70%, just a little bit, okay? This is all with his all pro left tackle missing, his number one wide receiver missing the majority of the season, and a-holes like me saying, go win the Super Bowl, yelling at them from the stands. So like, there's a lot of pressure on this team. Oh, and he played with a, a torn left labrum and broken ribs that happened against the Chiefs in week two. Week two, people, so despite some injuries, Herbert led this team to a bunch of wins. All right, that's fine, what's the next one? Did I get one right? The Vikings! I got that one 
right. The, there's no like applause, there's no general hoopla. Whoa. Happiness for me, oh, okay. Ugh. Uh, here's what happened. They win the North. I said it was gonna happen. They erased the deficit against the Colts. Uh, you know, but it, this is not something people were saying in the beginning of the year, okay? I, I just, I thought it was all about Zimmer. I, you know, I thought it was all about new blood being in there and Kevin O'Connell. And Kirk, did I predict Kirk O'Chains? Absolutely not. <laughs> I did not, and I did not retweet or co-sign it either. I was not on point with that, but it happened and uh, they did their thing. They finished with the best record in five seasons, second most wins in franchise history with 13. And the icing on the cake was taking home the crown. And also the icing on the cake is that Aaron Rodgers isn't wearing the crown. And Aaron Rodgers is golfing saying, I'm not going to Frisco or San Fran or whatever. Aren't you not supposed to say San Fran? Didn't he say San Fran? I think that's a rule. You're not supposed to do that. Okay, um, I think we have Aaron Rodgers next week. Oh. Um, so I'm not gonna say anything bad about him here. I'm just gonna say congratulations to Justin Jefferson and company and to the new head coach and all of that. All right, the third one, Richard smiling, so this means it's wrong. Okay, no, it was a good one. Okay, I got this one right too. Let's see here, AJ Brown, biggest and most important off season move. Am I wrong? Tell me if I'm wrong on this one. He has been incredible. Jalen and him are this elite dynamic duo, and then you throw in the Heisman winner, um, Swole Batman and Skinny Batman. The whole vibe is great, and Brown's impact didn't stop there. More eyes on AJ, less guys in the box. Um, this Eagles rushing attack was fifth in rushing yards. They led the league in rushing touchdowns. You, you think they're running just because of the offensive line? No, they're running because AJ gets a lot of defensive attention too, and he's opening things up for everybody. And how many receivers can get their head coaches to act like this? And he scores! <laughs> Marissa, he's wildin'. He's wildin' that coach Sirianni. 14-3 um, and three record. Top seed in the NFC, one game from hoisting the Lombardi Trophy. So this offense, you know, obviously went up. And to me, I think I, I, I'm going to stick with that. What was a better offseason? Oh, no, Christian was in offseason. Christian was in season. Yeah, best offseason move. Nate, there wasn't one. AJ was right. All right, there we go. That's it. Anything else? That's great. We're going to go to break. And we'll talk about the week and close it out here, right here on Up and Adams. Marissa. <laughs> This is a little doozy of a show. Starting Monday, we're taking the show on the road to Arizona. How exciting! Thanks, FanDuel. Up and Adams will be live at the Super Bowl with special guests all week. We have some booked. Guys whose name rhymes with Shmishran Mishmashri, um, Shmua Shmunga Bailoa, um, Shmarin Shrogers, I believe, one of them as well, Shmidi Shram. Um, who? Shmuda Shmaker? Uh, might be on the show. Let's just throw out some other ones that we want to manifest out there. How about like uh, Shradley Schrooper? Uh -huh. Shradley Schrooper would be a good one. You guys can get off that graphic. It doesn't really give any information. Oh, go straight to the side. Go ahead. Let's take a look. Go for it. For the let's first time ever in this Up and Adams people, let's go. Being My name was I'm trending just, because it was announced that I was going to be on your show. That's right. So I just lean like that to get out of the picture. <laughs> K was almost late, and there's a penalty right for that in football. Oh, he's gonna try. Oh. <laughs> it's like the Dumb and Dumber, so you're saying there's a chance. I'm definitely having great meals at night, and all the moms in Cincinnati are kicking my butt at Orange Theory in the mornings. <laughs> you gotta go to the bathroom. I was like, yeah, he was like, there's a car down there. I'm like, bro, I'm not taking the car. First tooth, big tooth. It ended up being $10, but I put him in singles. So she's got a little stack. She's got a little stack. I found it very disrespectful that he thought he could guard me and Croc. You out there abusing the neighborhood kids on Christmas Day, man? You mother. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have a good conversation with an alien. See that? I flex for you, right? <laughs> that's, an, that's an F. A little lower, a little lower. Shut up, lower! That's good. Take that, Carly's! For the record, this is going to cost us millions. I'm telling the finance guy this was your right. When you say go, yeah. that means I'm not coming back on the show? We, we got listen, we got Derwin James coming up. We got, we, oh, he's bigger than me. You missed the opportunity to drink. Well, my mom is drinking it, so like mother, like daughter. There's no perfect team. Even Beyonce wears a little makeup. Oh! Everything. What is a Riz God? Hammer time! 
I don't want you to hurt your neck. So I'm about to go play rock band. I'm looking at my drum set right now. I tuned in and you were talking about feet. And I was like, yo, I, I tuned in at the wrong second. I'm glad we're talking about field goals. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's about field goals. It's not It's not the Rex Ryan style feet. I'm sorry to say, they got zero chance to get some goals. Zero chance, bro. You know better than that. Come on, man. Zero. Come on, dog. I don't need a coin. I don't need this and that. Bengals, good luck. Chiefs, they're going to get y'all. Here's go. Is this a You're TV crazy. show? Is this a, wait, what happens? This is Marissa McBride, who you, of course, all know. We are going to Arizona. So this is our last yep. show here. Um, last week was our 100th episode, so we're like 106 in. Uh, Richard maybe can tell me in my ear how many episodes that we've done. 105. So big thanks to everyone. We've, we've moved studios. We've torn, <laughs> torn down studios. Uh -huh. So uh, it's all been a blast. And we're just getting started. We've got plans. We've got big plans, big plans for this Up and Adams situation and racket. So we're excited about that. Thanks to all of those guests. The guests make the show, I man. Know. It's we so, so fun. Many good ones. Who's your favorite? I mean, Marissa works with Darius Butler and yes. Weddle every week. Every, all the stuff you're seeing is, is all you. And then all the features that mm -hmm. Solomon Thomas one was great today. But Thank what's your you. favorite? guest appearance. Oh, that's hard. I don't know. I, I really like Chris Collinsworth in the beginning. That was hilarious. Great. Boston Scott feature was awesome to do. Yeah. And to see it like manifest into We've a We've had touchdown. a lot of your Eagles DK. on the show. Isn't that weird? I might be a little biased. I Isn't that weird with what's going on? I hear you're wearing a shirt that's for me. I wore a green shirt again. Okay, your dad is here. Mike McBride is here. Uh, hey, Uncle Kevin is here. Hey, Uncle Kevin. And here they are, and they are, you know, we got the Eagles garb on, and, and Mike got me a shirt, and then you didn't wear it. I'm sorry. You wore it. You wore I, my shirt. I had to wear it. Want to know I was why? going to be a floating head. Because she had a green shirt on, and she was going to, a green Eagle shirt, and she would have been floating in the, the green that screen. That was two here. times this week I've done that. Um, come find us at Super Bowl. We will be on Radio Row. Hats. We're going to make it fun. We've got a lot of hats to give out. What else do we got? We got... Gushers. Gushers. Dunkaroos. 818 tequila. Tequila, more importantly. And a ping pong table. Yes, we do. I got it. I ordered it. Did you really? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. See you Monday.